Hello and welcome to the Templum Digital Assets Report. I'm Patricia Wu along with my co-host, co-founder of Templum, Vincent Molinari, and we are here at the New York Stock Exchange. We have a very special guest at the NYSE today, SEC Commissioner Robert Jackson. Sworn in last January, Jackson has extensive experience as a legal scholar, policy professional, and corporate lawyer. He comes to the SEC from NYU School of Law, where he taught. Previously, he was professor of law at Columbia Law School and director of its program, Corporate Law and Policy. This is his second stint working for the government. In 2010, Jackson was senior policy advisor at the U.S. Treasury, working with Kenneth Feinberg, the special master for TARP executive compensation. It is great to have you here, Commissioner. We've been looking forward to this. So we have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm gonna get right to it. Cryptocurrency debate, we have been hearing a lot about it. Is it a security, a commodity, a currency? Where do you see this going from a regulatory standpoint? Well, thanks so much for having me here today. I'm thrilled to have the chance to talk about it. It's clear to me that the market on crypto is continuing to change literally every day. Um, but I think it's become clear that the CFTC and our colleagues in the commodity and uh, currency space are going to be taking the lead on direct cryptocurrency regulation to the degree we're going to have some. Um, that makes sense to me, given the structure and the use of the product. Um, but I think we should stay tuned because as we have seen with the development, for example, of a, uh, exchange traded funds in that area, it's pretty clear that we could still have securities law implications for some cryptocurrencies. So we'll have to stay tuned and see where the market goes to understand what the future is going to be of regulation in that space. When you say stay tuned, can you give us any hint of what we should be looking for? Sure. So, I mean, if you take a look at what we've done in the ETF space, you can see we were thinking of um, a Bitcoin driven ETF in that area. We uh, addressed one such application last year and we denied that application as you know, uh, by a three to one vote. Um, I have said a few times that um, I think eventually we're gonna find the market coming to us with an ETF that really does protect investors and achieves the goals we have uh, for both cryptocurrency and an ETF based on them. Uh, we're not there yet, but I hope we're heading in that direction. So let's jump into that for a moment, if we may. And, and terrific to have you here today. And I think one of the, po the points that I want to bring forward is that you do embrace technology and innovation, right? and I think that's an important message for the marketplace. Uh, beyond cryptocurrency, when we talk about digital assets, how do we foster better capital formation? How do we make it more efficient? But most importantly, how do we protect investors while doing so? So if you could share some of your views on that, that'd be terrific. Well, thanks so much. I, I appreciate the opportunity to say a little bit about this because one of the things that's been happening about this debate is that there are some of us who are for innovation and some of us who are against innovation. Everybody at the SEC and in the government is in favor of innovation. What we want is to make sure that as the market develops, it does so in a way that's safe for investors. And here's why I care so much about that. Not because I want to regulate or because I want to in intervene in the market, but because I want the asset class and the technology underly underlying all this to be associated with what it should be associated with, which is growth, which is the ability to be more inclusive in our system, which is the ability of anybody to go out and buy these products and use them safely. Uh, for me, it's so important that we make sure people understand that they're protected when they get into these assets, so that in 10 years when we're talking about these assets, everybody accepts that it's a safe place to be. So I wanted to go back to the ETF question. Mm -hmm. You said last month we would see an approval eventually. Could you give us some clarification on that eventually? Sure, happy to, happy to talk more about it. You know, the question I was asked is, do I imagine that someday the marketplace will bring to us a structure that we can get comfortable on for a crypto ETF? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. But the question I've been getting over the last few weeks is when? And the answer is, I don't decide that. The market decides that. When the ETF applications come in that reflect true investor protections. Let's go back and talk a little bit about the uh, ETF proposal that we denied last year, the Winklevoss proposal. I have to be honest with you, I don't think that was an especially close case. The underlying uh, assets there were easily manipulable, as we described in the order. Uh, there was very little trading transparency around that, and I really worried that somebody with bad intent could go into that marketplace with not a lot of money and manipulate the price and hurt the people who are in the ETF. And here's why I care so much about that. It's not that I want to say yes or no to a particular product. It's that I want to make sure that American investors know that the Bitcoin asset class and all the cryptocurrency space is an asset they can trust. And if we approve something too soon and people get hurt, the entire asset class and maybe even the entire blockchain technology is going to get painted with a brush of fraud and bad actors. 
And I simply can't have that because I want to be sitting here in 10 years talking with you about how many American investors are in crypto rather than talking about frauds that have happened in the space. So, Commissioner, if I could follow on that, there's some great points within that. So it's not so much the ETF itself. In many instances, it's the underlying instrument and how that's being able to be surveilled or lack thereof, right. being that it's not transacted today on a regulated exchange. Or, as you say, those instruments perhaps can be more readily um, manipulated. Yep. And it's all about investor protection, particularly when you have retail mom and pop and what could be retirement savings uh, yep. that could be exposed to those. So. It, I, I think uh, very important to protect the marketplace, the bad actors, because this technology, when we go back to the technology, has so many great advantages to yeah. our capital formation when we talk about access to better capital, more efficient, um, and we don't want to see that be um, have a black eye. Oh man, I couldn't agree with that more. Let me just say a little bit more about it. I think we're just learning what this technology can do. I'm very excited about crypto, I'm very excited about those applications, but I'm even more excited about things like smart contracts, the things you can do with this technology are truly, truly extraordinary. And my concern is I want to be sure American investors understand that value proposition and feel like they're protected. Um, I'm a guy, you know, look, I was previously an investment banker, uh, after that I was a corporate lawyer. When I'm trying to figure out the right thing to do, I talk to the marketplace. And right now, the marketplace for ETFs and crypto that underlies those ETFs is very, very immature. It's not a lot of liquidity, it's not a lot of transparency. And I'm waiting for the market to come to us with something where I can say, investors can be in this technology and be safe. So like I said, in 10 years, we're sitting here talking about how millions of Americans are in that asset, rather than talking about frauds that have painted the asset class with the wrong brush. That's perfect. Maybe I can pivot uh, to a broader conversation from cryptocurrency. And I think it's really important when we differentiate from the technology, uh, cryptocurrency mm -hmm. and digital assets. Yeah. So when we look at digital assets, we look at how do we make the unregistered marketplace a better, more efficient, transparent marketplace. And if we go to the SEC's report from DIRA, uh, when we talked about 2017, $3 trillion of annual issuance of unregistered securities in yeah. the United States relative People uh, don't really believe it until they see it in writing from the commission. 1.5 trillion in the same period of time on, on public issuances. Yep. So I think as we look at a result of the Jobs Act, yep. right, this tremendous growth of unregistered securities. How do we make that a better, more transparent marketplace? And we do think smart contracts, digital securities, smart securities, gives us that overlay for the first time to have audit trails, yep. symmetry of information on private unregistered securities that we don't have today. Yep. And then how does that go on a pathway to secondary liquidity? Yeah. So are we then changing our thought process around what a private security was and intended to be versus where it's morphing today relative to maybe blurring the lines a bit with public and private? Well, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm very excited about where this is headed because if we just step back and ask ourselves this question, right now, the private capital markets are as vibrant and as exciting as they've ever been really in American history. No question. And a lot of people talk about that as if it's a problem because there are fewer IPOs. And I, I actually agree, our chairman has said, we want to encourage companies to come public and, and I don't disagree with that. But in the meantime, as private companies are getting funded uh, with this sort of capital that they can do in, in significant scale, we need to think about, with all those unregistered securities, what is a system that we can be comfortable with for them to be, uh, to be traded, to have secondary liquidity in those instruments. I'm very excited by the potential of technology to open that door. And I think once we do, American investors, so long as we can have investor protections in place, are going to embrace it. And we might get more and more opportunities for ordinary investors to participate in the most exciting startups in our country. You know, Vince, I'll tell you, one of the things that keeps me up at night is the idea that the most exciting growth stories in America are not including American investors. You know, when I was a banker, we had great, exciting new companies, but we took them public. And ordinary mom and pop investors, Mr. and Mrs. 401k, could be invested in those companies. Today, Uber's had a great growth story, but it's limited to a very select few. And I think we need to change that, and I think technology is the answer. Hey Amen. And I, you know, I could talk about this all day long, but it goes back to the early days of the Jobs Act, the democratization of capital formation, the access of that new product, and opening up for wealth creation for investors who don't have that opportunity. That's right. So I think when we do look at this technology ability, to be able to surveil, to be able to have investor protection early in the cycle is so important to our growth as a nation, to our job creation, and really our economic prosperity. So I couldn't agree with you more. Well, that's exactly right, man. And just let me add one more point. 
I, I'm of the view that the answer to this problem is not to roll back investor protections. I understand why I have colleagues who say, you know what would be great? Why don't we just all get out of the way and let private capital trade as, uh, as if it were public capital? I have to tell you, I think it's a mistake. For the same reason I think it'd be a mistake for us to approve a Bitcoin ETF too soon. The reason it would be a mistake is if we don't have those investor protections in place, ordinary American investors will get hurt. And when they get hurt, people will not be as willing to make those investments. And that's just not good for the long run growth of our markets and our economy. What we need to do is use the technology we've got to put systems in place that make guys like you and me who spend time in the market confident that people are gonna be protected. And as soon as we get there, we're gonna have some very exciting developments in both the private and the public capital markets. Speaking of things that keep you up at night, cyber attacks. The SEC recently updated its guidelines on a cyber attack uh, reporting, yeah. but stopped short of a rule of when a cyber attack should be reported, something you've been advocating. Yes. What would that look like? So a couple of things about this. Um, my very first month on the commission, uh, the chairman put before us a proposal for commission level guidance detailing what we expect public companies to do when it comes to transparency and controls around cyber. And I was so glad this was the first vote I cast and I wouldn't have it any other way because you all know this is a 24 hour a day, 365 day a year war against not just American companies, but in my opinion, it's against our whole way of life. We have people, sometimes state sponsored, bad actors out there who want to make it hard for us to do the things technology lets us do. They want to get at our way of life, our basic data about who we are, where we are, who we talk to, and American companies are on the front lines of that. So when we issued that guidance, we said, guys, we know you're at war. Here are the things we want you to do. And a few months later, my office did a study where we looked at all of the data breaches in public companies in 2017, and we looked at how often those data breaches led to public disclosure to investors. And what we found was very troubling. 97% of the time we found even after a breach had been disclosed, say, to consumers or to the attorney general of the state, even after that, 97% of the time, public companies didn't disclose it. <laughs> and I pushed my colleagues on the commission to say, we might need a rule here to tell people what to do. Now, I promised I would update that study. And last week, I gave a speech in, um, on Wall Street Journal, uh, with the Wall Street Journal, where I explained that in 2018, that rate fell to 90%. So, uh, yeah, so it used to be that 97% of the time companies didn't disclose it. Now it's 90% of the time they don't disclose it. Or if you prefer, one out of 10 times American public companies disclose a hack. Now to me, that's improvement, but it's slow. And I'm worried that this is moving more quickly than that. That what's gonna happen if we don't develop a clear rule of this game is we're gonna have a significant hack, investors are gonna get hurt, and it's gonna be bad for the marketplace and the economy. Yeah, we've already seen some significant hacks. So yeah. How, quick, how do you think you can speed this up then? Yeah, I think we need a bright line rule at the SEC that says, if you have a hack, you've got to disclose it. Now, people have pushed back on me and said, you know, Rob, how do we design that rule? And I'm very open to that. Our, in general, our 8K rules, which govern brand new information like this, are very general, are principles based. We don't have to specify every single thing that has to be disclosed. We just have to let companies know when this happens to you, you have a disclosure obligation. And I have favored that approach because I'll tell you, when I talk to folks in the marketplace right now, they tell me, you know, Rob, it's not that people don't want to disclose, it's that we don't think the law makes us. And it's a very hard thing for a board of directors who knows that they're gonna have a bad day when they disclose a hack to go out there and do it voluntarily. So my view is it's time for us to develop a rule in this area and I'm hoping I'm gonna get my colleagues to agree with me. Speaking of rules, and maybe we can't uh, shed too much light on this, but when we go back to the size and scope of our private unregistered marketplaces, one of the big things that continues to come up is custody. Yeah. Right? And, and, we, and we talk about the big institutional flows of money aren't going to arrive in, in, in this space until this custody because the commission is asking for yep. custody. And, and I would say from market participant standpoint, there's a, a little bit of a rub, right? Mm -hmm. When we talk about unregistered private securities, there's not uh, custody rule, therefore, there is not custodian. So we have this public company nomenclature of, of custody and what that means. Yeah. And, and how do we create? How do we uh, put something forth? And maybe maybe it's the market participants that need to create something with some further guidance from the commission yep. of how do how do we solve for this? Right. And it goes back to kind of that blurring of the lines, I think, again, between public and private. Man, I think this is so important and I'm glad you raised it because this is a classic example of what we were talking about before, which is you have a commission right now that pays a lot of attention to the marketplace. 
and market participants. And what we need to hear from you is, what do you think the best practices are and the principles and the technology you can use to establish custody in situations like this? And I gotta tell you, on the particular issue of custody of unregistered securities, there's a lot of exciting things happening. I think there's an answer on the horizon there. And what I'm encouraging all market participants to do is come in and talk to us because I think the SEC over the years, for reasons as a former banker I understand, has gotten a reputation of a place you'd rather stay out of. And what I want to tell you is that for market participants who want to move the ball, this is the time to come in and talk to us about these subjects. I'm not saying we're always going to give you the answer you want, and I'm not saying we're not going to ask hard questions, that's our job. But I do think that especially on issues like custody, if people get together with principles that make sense, that we're confident can protect investors, you're going to find that we're listening at the SEC. Well, I can tell you firsthand, the commission has been amazingly welcoming to hear new ideas, to engage with market participants like ourselves. And again, whether that's at the commissional level, whether it's staff, trading markets, corp, fin, TA, IM, across the spectrum. And it's really been refreshing. And I think that's a story, frankly, that's missing that needs to be told that, yes, if you do something wrong, yes, absolutely, you're yeah. going to get the, the hard hand of the SEC as well you should. But on the other hand, demystifying the SEC a bit. And it's really been extraordinarily engaging and thoughtful through this process. So thank you to the commission for that. Oh, I pre I mean, I think that's really a testament to Jay Clayton's leadership. He's, he's really worked hard on that. And he and I are both guys who spent a lot of time in the marketplace. And so here's the thing to understand about us. We know the difference between serious market participants and bad actors. And the way you put it, Vince, is just right. If you act in a way that's not consistent with our market experience, yeah, we're going to hit you and we're going to make it hurt because we're actually out to make the market work for ordinary American investors and we want to make sure that the people who are doing the, the right thing are rewarded by attracting the kind of investment they deserve. Absolutely. On that note, I think that was the perfect way to wrap it up.